Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Adam Smith Institute uh, for another of our Enlightenment evenings. Um, this evening we have a treat for you. Um, usually uh, it is our chairman, James Lawson, interviewing the author of a paper, for example, me. Um, so for a treat, I thought this evening we should interview him um, on the latest uh, bit of research we've, been, we've put out called uh, Cost of Rent Day. Um, Give a quick remark to James. James is the chairman of the Adam Smith Institute, also a fellow here. He's a former special advisor in uh, the very highest uh, areas of power in Whitehall. Um, and he's, uh, alongside being a chairman of the Adam Smith Institute, he is also a director at a leading deep tech company um, in the private sector. In terms of where you are here this evening, the Adam Smith Institute is a leading neoliberal think tank uh, regarded by the University of Pennsylvania as the uh, best independent think tank on economic policy. Um, despite our small size, it's the ideas that matter. Um, speaking of those ideas, we've, we've long been um, in favor of building more houses, whether that's the idea of street votes, which has successfully uh, gained royal assent recently, which is, allows you to put mansards on your house if you could own one. Um, <laughs> we've also done a lot of research into the green belt and why it's bad for growth and why we should permit building on the green belt. And uh, finally, we've come up with new ways of doing housing by redefining the uh, planning system. Um, but that brings us to our latest piece of research, cost of rent day. Cost of rent day is um, it's a simple concept. We are essentially asking and finding out when the average person on the average wage in the UK finishes paying their landlord before tax. Um, so we'll kick off, uh, James. Can you quickly explain in greater detail than what I just gave um, on what cost of rent day is and how you got the figures? Yeah, so I think um, before we answer what is cost of rent day, an important thing you're all probably desperate to know is when is cost of uh, rent day. So it has uh, recently uh, passed. It was on uh, the uh, 5th of May and uh, we celebrated it at the ASI. Um, it's a new uh, piece of analysis um, that we are doing and we'll run from every year uh, here on out. Um, so it's the 5th of May, but what is the 5th of May? What happens on, on the 5th of May aside from celebrations across uh, the land. Um, it is the day uh, when renters in England, specifically England, and I'll get on to why later, but when renters in England finally stop paying rent and uh, finally have money left over to spend on other things. Um, now, uh, we'll talk more about taxation later as well because that's something else they've got to spend a lot of money on. Um, but it is, as I said, the, the, the day when they have finally uh, finished paying off their, their rent bill. Um, so they work 125 days on average. The average renter in England works 125 days uh, to pay their rent. And on the 126th day, uh, they can celebrate. Now for the more mathematical amongst you in the room, you'll say, isn't that the 4th of May? Uh, but this year is a uh, leap year. Um, and so that, the, <laughs> that uh, is uh, why um, it falls on that day. Um, in London, uh, it's too early to celebrate if you live in London, which I'm assuming many people in this room do. Uh, so on the 16th of July, we in this room, uh, those who live in London can start to uh, celebrate. Um, and for the unfortunate or fortunate amongst you who live in uh, Kensington and Chelsea, um, you have to wait until the 25th of September uh, to finally, <laughs> finally stop paying off uh, your uh, landlord. Um, it's not uh, all that bad, it varies across uh, the country and we'll talk about that uh, more later, I'm uh, sure. Um, how do we calculate it? So we know when it is, we roughly know hopefully what it is now. Uh, how do we calculate it? It's actually uh, quite simple, aside for some challenges in, in the data sources. Um, I looked at what's the average pay in England and I looked at what's the average rent in England and then on that basis it was quite an easy division to work out well how much of the year do you spend uh, on rent versus how much do you have left over to spend on uh, other things what what is the proportion um, for those interested in the maths I used median figures rather than mean wherever possible because there are uh, the, the data is quite skewed uh, so that's a better average uh, to take and I used publicly available data sets um, I used uh, what was available from uh, the ONS, uh, so in particular the uh, survey they do of uh, private rentals and the survey they do uh, on, uh, on uh, income. Um, on income it's interesting to note uh, that it's based on HMRC data, so 
Uh, they look at PAYE, they look at uh, salaries in particular, uh, and they take a sample of 1% of the UK to, uh, to come up with their figures. Um, very crudely, the maths is um, that the average renter in England spends £850 a month. Uh, add that up, it's uh, 10200 a year. Um, with an average income of around 30K, you get to 34% through the year or 125 days uh, to pay off your rent. So that's uh, what it is, when it is, and when you can celebrate it in other parts of, uh, of the UK. Well, that's helpful, James. Thank you very much. Um, but the question is, you've done all the maths, you've thought about it, you've visualised it. Why did you come up with the idea in the first place? Yeah, um, very good question. Uh, so first, it was inspired by some other research that the ASI does, and we would ask you to, to, to keep an eye out for it, which is Tax Freedom Day. Uh, so Tax Freedom Day is a long-running measure that the ASI has produced for decades now, um, which looks at how much of your pay packet, how much of your money needs to be spent to pay off uh, the government um, and in taxes before you can uh, finally enjoy uh, the income for yourself. Um, a very clever and very, uh, I think, popular metric that helps to really summarize the state of the nation um, and helps to capture um, the slow and steady and incremental increase and in expanse of the size of the state over, uh, over the last decades. And an easy way of checking if we're making progress or not uh, with respect to taxation uh, in the UK. Um, I'll give you a spoiler. Tax Freedom Day has been uh, delayed year on year for uh, many years now. Um, and uh, in our view, taxation is, 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 is too high. But that's a discussion for another day for Tax Freedom Day when we do an event uh, then. But um, I sat there thinking about uh, Tax Freedom Day and the associated cost of government day uh, that we do and thought, well, why don't we look at this for housing uh, as well? And my initial ambition was to do it for um, housing costs in general. Uh, but the data around that and the calculations around that were quite complex. So concluded, why don't we start with uh, renters, particularly um, given the work we've done with the Next Generation Centre, and I think it's uh, a, a challenge that particularly faces uh, young people, that that would appeal. And ultimately, the intent is to take a topic that is quite complex, where there isn't, unfortunately, a consensus in, uh, the, in the country at large or with policymakers on the on the need to, for action, let alone the policy solutions, and make it something that's really easy to translate, really easy uh, to understand. It's an imperfect measure, and if you read the methodology section of the report, uh, we've had to make certain compromises to come up with a date. Um, but I think it captures, in a really simple way, just how bad the housing crisis has got in the UK, and in England in particular, and uh, just how bad it's got for renters within that group uh, in particular. I was, I was going to say, you, you mentioned there are issues with the methodology um, and the data sets. Um, I'm always one to say the ONS, where we get a lot of the data from, is like Swiss cheese. It's full of holes and it stinks. Was this an issue you found on doing, for doing cost of rent day? Uh, so, so data was one of the biggest uh, challenges. So I said right at the beginning, renters in England, and I emphasize the England. Um, the reason. Uh, we only calculated this for England this year was because the data set provided by the ONS doesn't cover the rest of the country. So we couldn't have done it for Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, even if we wanted to. Or if we had done it for those areas, we'd have used a different data set and it might have implied things that weren't true in terms of regional uh, comparisons. We wanted one data set that uses the same methodology and the same approach from ONS. The, there isn't one that was appropriate for this analysis. If you know of one that we don't know of, please let me know and we will use it next year. But as far as we were aware, there, there was no suitable uh, data set for that. Uh, the second uh, problem uh, was around uh, localities. So even in the data that they do provide for England, um, there are weird and unexplained gaps in the data. Um, so just some local areas don't have any, uh, don't have any data at all on uh, rent or on, um, on income. Um, so we weren't able to do this for all of, the, of, of England. We were on an aggregate level because they publish a headline for England, but we, when we did the local analysis, we could only do it for 309 uh, local areas in terms of ONS data across England. Um, 
also some issues around income for reasons completely unexplained. Um, I, I, so I said we use median as an average because it's the better of the two to use. But for some places, it didn't have the median. So then we had to use the mean. And we've caveated where, uh, we, uh, where we did that. Um, so just from those three examples, you can see some interesting curiosities in the way the ONS, and Office for National Statistics, uh, approaches uh, producing statistics for the whole nation, uh, whereby it's England only, some local areas aren't covered, and the data within the tables has uh, unexplained emissions uh, without any justification. Yeah, I mean, there's a really good insight into how we do data collection in the UK. Are, are there any other, well, what would you say is the most interesting insight you've gained from doing this analysis and for cost of rent day? I think, I think in, in, in my opinion, it's probably one that's more linked to uh, policy. Um, but the fact that um, salaries, albeit higher in London and in, in areas where you'd expect them perhaps to be higher, actually don't compensate for the increased rent. Um, my intuition going into the report would be that cost of rent day would be uh, fairly chaotically dispersed across the country. And there'd be some interesting geographies for very particular reasons that had a, uh, a, a higher cost of rent day, maybe uh, a particularly NIMBY local population or some blockages to planning in their local area. Um, and I was surprised to find um, that in reality, it was much more correlated just to the, the cities um, and in particular, the Southeast and, and London, uh, the areas where people are flowing in and there's a lot of demand. Um, and that um, in particular, the salaries don't compensate. That even with higher salaries in central London and in the city, um, for young people who have made a decision to consciously move to London because they think the job prospects are, and opportunities are better, um, unfortunately, that, that higher salary is not enough to compensate. Um, and so they are making a trade-off about what their future outcomes might be. But right now, they're actually worse off than if they, if they stayed out of the cities in many ways. Which is a great shame because they're supposed to be a 24-hour city and you know, built for young people. There's some other research we've done recently on this, which you'll find out in another Enlightenment evening. But I mean, it's another, I'm biased, but an excellent initiative by the Adam Smith Institute on the topic of housing. Um, when do you think policymakers are actually going to listen to us? I mean, the Times recently came out with a really interesting uh, table looking at, you know, where are the most NIMBY and YIMBY councils? All of the YIMBY councils were either Labour and a couple of Tory, but all of the NIMBY councils full of Lib Dems and Tories. Shock horror. Um, so, so I mean, really, when do you think policymakers are actually going to listen? Um, so I'd probably step away from the, the partisan politics. Um, I don't think it's necessarily one party or the other that's going to solve the issue, unfortunately. Um, and I think the uh, problem uh, for policymakers is across all party lines. Um, I think those who claim to be in favour of development um, within their, even within their own geography, when really pushed by local constituents, when really pushed to the test, suddenly find that they are, 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 are NIMBYs. And that's extremely uh, common in, uh, in, in government. Uh, they, they say one thing uh, and do something very different in, in, in their actions. Um, and, I, I, and I think the polls suggest that there may be a, a change of government and a change of party. And uh, the opposition is saying some very uh, pro-housing uh, reform uh, things to date. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if they get deprioritized, or that when it comes to the crunch, a lot of their backbenchers will actually take a, a, a different line. So I think it, um, to the when, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be an immediate thing. I think um, we need initiatives like Cost of Rent Day um, to help convince policymakers that the housing crisis is as bad as it is. And we need people in the room who are passionate about this topic to to man the barricades and shout for uh, change because um, I think the only way this, uh, the, the housing crisis will genuinely be solved is by quite radical planning reform and a massive increase in uh, the building of new properties, the building of new types of properties, uh, an increase in supply. Um, demand is already massively outstripping it. Demand isn't going to decline in any way. Um, so basic Econ 101, uh, we're going to need a boost in supply. You're right. I, I agree entirely. However, build your houses where? Because as we can see with Costa Rende, it tends to be in those urban areas, southeast, bit of Manchester. Um, I mean, 
if I was cynical, I'd say cost of rent day is a problem for the sneering metropolitan liberal elite <laughs> and not for everyday working people up and down the country. Would you agree with that? Short answer, no. Um, so the cost of rent and the cost of rent day is too late everywhere in the country. Um, it's particularly bad in London, but it's bad across the whole country. We are spending far too much of a proportion of our salaries, if we're renters, on rent. Um, and I'm sure from the analysis I did, but we didn't publish, uh, the, the cost of housing in general, even for people who don't rent, is, uh, is, is far too high. So people who have to take out mortgages, first-time buyers, I think across the property spectrum, um, aside from those who bought their property 30, 40 years ago, everybody is, is suffering for this. Uh, with a range of, of uh, bad policy and societal outcomes as a result. Um, and I, I think other interesting things I noticed uh, from the data is that um, ultimately I, I don't think it's just a question of population growth or immigration. I think it is fundamentally a problem of lack of supply. Those other things might be exacerbating factors, but until we fix the supply issue, um, this is going to remain a problem. And I think even in the Northeast, where uh, cost of rent day is the, uh, on average, is uh, the 31st of March, that, in my opinion, is far, far too late. Um, and the, the ambition for the nation has got to be that it's much, much earlier. I mean, at the same time, I mean, we, we've developed the tool to give people a perspective on the housing crisis. And as you said, James, we're trying to highlight to policymakers about this problem. And as we know, as you've highlighted, a lot of this is a problem for young people. But we also know that young people don't turn out to vote. So it's the incumbents who remain in power who kind of like the housing crisis if a lot of your money and capital is in rent. So do you think this tool is going to help young people to actually speak up for their own policy issues and interests? I mean, I, I'd love it if it did. Um, I uh, don't give myself for one tool uh, so much agency as to change, uh, to change policy alone. Um, I think there's a range of things that young people can do to, um, to I think, promote the cause. Um, there's gr great groups like Priced Out, for example, that I know you're involved in, and um, one of our patrons, uh, Brandon Lewis, is uh, a, a, a supporter of. Uh, so there are groups like that that are more a, a grassroots entity to uh, lobby for uh, change on uh, this particular uh, topic. Um, but I don't think that the tool alone will get there. It's there really to just highlight how bad the problem is and enable us over time to check if it's improving or, 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 or getting even worse. I mean, you've, you've done all the analysis, you've got lots of the data, so you must have the answer to when the optimal cost of rent day is. Yeah, um, good question. January the 1st. Yeah, Jan <laughs> January the 1st would, would uh, be ideal. Um, and if we look at the costs of other goods uh, in the economy, um, particularly in, re in, in sectors that are not regulated by government, where you don't need planning permission to take action, it's very interesting how over decades prices have got much, much, much cheaper. Um, you think about uh, buying a plasma television, as they used to be called uh, decades ago, and you were looking at five to ten grand to get a decent one, um, and now it's literally hundreds of quid to get something that is also a better product, not just the same size and flat against the wall, but fundamentally a much, much better product uh, in 4K or high definition rather than, in, rather than a grainy old plasma. That's what happens in a good, well-functioning market, of which there are, 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 are many. Um, but I think housing is an example of one where uh, it is, is not a well-functioning market because of the regulations that have been imposed. Now, 1st of January, probably not uh, realistic uh, for obvious reasons. So what would I actually want to aim for? I'd say late Feb. Late Feb is a realistic goal. Um, if you look back at the 80s and you look back at uh, other cities across the world, um, in, in Washington, in the United States, um, under 15% of a typical young person's income went on to rent in the 80s. Um, in New York City, in Manhattan in the 80s, you spend a lower proportion of your income on getting a, a rental property in New York City 
than you would in the northeast of England today. So to your question earlier of is this just a problem for the liberal metropolitan elite um, in London, no. The fact that to buy a property in the northeast of England, um, or to rent a property in the northeast of England is costing you more as so a proportion of your income versus New York City in the 80s, I think is a really damning indictment of where the situation is today and the fact that it is across the whole of the UK. One other uh, thought on this. It's obviously not just a, uh, a rental problem. Uh, there's a much deeper economic problem that we need to get at uh, in the UK, which is income. Because another way of bringing cost of rent day forward is to earn a lot more uh, money to uh, boost labor productivity and boost salaries uh, so that people can, uh, can, can, can afford to spend more uh, on rent. And unfortunately, the stats there are, are similarly concerning. Um, we are trending towards two lost, doc two lost decades uh, without uh, any significant increase in per capita income, basically since 2008. You could argue even potentially the rot set in earlier uh, than, than that. Um, and I look at Japan, where they've had three lost decades as the example of what not to do and just how bad it can get. And so I hope in 15 years' time, when we're looking at cost of rent day then, that it has moved rapidly in the direction towards February uh, and that both uh, re uh, rental properties are, are cheaper and the per capita incomes have dramatically risen in the UK to make up for, for lost time. I mean, w we speak about you know, renters, of course. The other side of the equation are landlords. And Adam Smith had quite a lot to say on landlords. Some would all, or even call him a proto-Georgist, if you're of that persuasion. Um, the Marxists like to claim him uh, for their own, and they're mad, so I, I won't come on to that. But fundamentally, James, is, is this an anti-landlord project? It is not. Um, and that might surprise uh, some people uh, in the audience, uh, but it is not an anti-landlord uh, project. Um, and it's also not a call for rent controls, quite uh, the opposite. Um, and while we have diagnosed the problem and we are highlighting the problem, uh, our policy solutions are, are very, very different. Um, Asar Limbeck, uh, famous economist, uh, famously said, and I'll, I'll butcher it because I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, uh, but that rent controls appear to be the most efficient way, the most efficient technique uh, available to destroy a city short of bombing. Um, and I think he was right. And I think the, um, the reason for that is that landlords do actually play an important role, um, much as some of them are, can be awful individuals and some of them may not be operating within the bounds of the contracts and, and things like that. That happens in all walks of life and it happens in other industries. Um, but they play a very important role. And also the price mechanism, even more fundamental than the landlords, the price mechanism plays a fundamental role role and is a, I, I think, a holy concept that needs to be defended, um, but is all too often uh, misunderstood or ignored uh, altogether. The price you are paying for something is sending a signal. In the case of high rents, it is sending a signal, build more properties, build more houses, build more homes. Um, and in a normal functioning market, with prices so high, people would do so and they would make more rental properties. Um, it's because they're not able to do so that we don't have a functioning uh, market. The problem with rent controls is that you are intervening in what is left of the functioning market. As I've already said, for many reasons, it's not a functioning market because of the restriction of supply. But you are intervening even further and in the most perilous uh, way. Uh, and Ryan Bourne uh, has a book that recently came out on price controls in general. And Eamon Butler, um, our director and founder, wrote an excellent chapter in it. So. Um, I recommend people go to all good bookshops and get that book to understand the price mechanism further. But if I may wrap up on why prices are so, so uh, important. Uh, as well as sending a signal to the market and to people to take action, um, it's also a problem if you hold it artificially low. So if you hold the, f the, the rent uh, artificially low with rent controls, the signal you send to landlords is, this is a bad idea, don't be a landlord. In fact, don't bother redeveloping the property. Uh, don't maintain it in fit condition. And what will eventually happen is you'll see a de decrease in the supply of rental properties. 
uh, which makes the problem even worse, makes it harder to get uh, a, a, a property to rent. Um, so you'll end up with shortages and people sort of clustering together in ever smaller properties. Um, and you'll see a decline in the quality of uh, rental properties as well. Um, and so what it does is gives the artificial illusion of a, of a policy support, but actually um, fundamentally distorts the market further and leads to worse outcomes long term. So uh, let's not intervene with the price mechanism in, in that way. Lastly, landlords. So they do play an important role. Um, and even in a perfect market where um, houses were, were, were re really cheap to buy, there's still uh, value in having rental properties. Um, they, as landlords, are taking on risk. Um, there might be vacancies. Uh, they might have bad tenants who don't pay on time or damage the property. Uh, there are fluctuations in a normally functioning market. Um, and so they are taking on risk with their capital. And a good landlord will actually redevelop and improve the properties that they're renting because the price will go up and they'll be able to uh, charge uh, higher rents long, long term. Renting as a concept and landlords as a concept uh, is, is, a, is a positive one. It's a way of sweating an asset more effectively and catering to more flexible uh, approaches. And I think we'll start to see it in other sectors. So if we take um, the, uh, the vehicle sector today in cars, um, I think as we start to see the emergence of, say, driverless cars, there will potentially be new models where you don't actually buy a driverless car, you just rent it for the trips you, you need it for, um, and therefore sweat the asset really well across lots of uh, different people. So not anti-landlord, <laughs> and certainly think that the price mechanism is something that needs to be handled very, very carefully, and ultimately uh, left to Adam Smith's invisible hand as much as possible. On the topic of that final point, there's the idea of subscribing to a car. And there's some um, research coming out soon about housing as a subscription. So please do keep your eyes out for that. Um, I'm, I'll kind of wrap it up here. I mean, I assume everyone who turned up here today wants to listen to your dulcet tones and your, your fantastic insights, James. So to close off, what do you suggest our audience and people listening online do to help with this mission of bringing Costa Rent Day back earlier into the year? Well, for those who have NIMBY instincts today, um, please repent. Uh, there is a path. <laughs> there is a there's a there is a path uh, forward for you, um, and uh, it is one of compassion because you are helping future generations um, if you allow that project down the road to to go ahead. I think we've all been in situations where something's happening in your backyard, and you're thinking, "Oh well, not for me." But you know, as a whole, we should build more. And I think I would ask people to, to, to think uh, twice. I'd say mo just more broadly, because there are some new faces in the audience, uh, sign up to uh, the ASI's uh, bulletin, where you can hear from Eamon our latest, uh, latest antics at the ASI, latest research, latest events, and, and all of that, uh, and become uh, more involved. Uh, for the particularly eager amongst you, those who are passionate about the topic, I'd encourage you to consider writing for us, uh, submit uh, uh, op-eds and things to the blog, or even uh, consider doing your own uh, policy uh, paper if you think you have uh, what, it's ta what it takes. Um, and then I'd say get involved in other groups. We're not the only uh, ones publishing research in this area. Our, our friends down the road at the Institute of Economic Affairs, um, the CPS, uh, and many others have, have written um, good uh, research on housing. Uh, some of it building on ideas that we came up with, others uh, completely original, um, and I would encourage you to uh, go to them as well. Um, lastly, I mentioned them earlier, but I'll give another shout out for uh, Price Stout, um, who uh, I think a really inspiring uh, group. Uh, I'm not involved with them myself, so I have no vested interest there, but obviously know that, that you are involved with them, and I think it's great to have a sort of bottom-up grassroots movement uh, to make the case for, uh, for tackling the, the, the challenge of housing. Um, and I think that's, that's a good starter for 10. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it will require everyone in this room uh, to man the barricades with the ASI and with groups like Priced Out if we are to, to change this. And I think it is just so fundamental that we do, because if people cannot have a stake in capitalism, they cannot afford a home, or if they cannot rent a property at a reasonable price, they will lose their faith in the very fundamentals of capitalism. 
and I think it has societal impacts as well. It means it's more costly uh, and people are less likely to have kids. It means that people have less money to invest in other projects and start their own businesses. I think it is uh, one of those uh, issues that really uh, potentially, you can argue, lies at the root of many of other societal problems in, uh, in, in the UK. And I think it is so fundamental for uh, policymakers of all stripes, civil servant and multiple colours of party, uh, to get a grip on this topic. Um, otherwise, um, we are in a, in, a, in a bad place. But there is hope. On, there, is, there is a sudden upland that we can get to. Um, we just need to tackle this problem. And it is easy to tackle. Uh, it requires liberalizing the planning system and allowing the market to do what it does best. Absolutely. I, I know that, unfortunately, I, I would like to give some questions to the audience. Only five minutes. Only five minutes, if that's all right. Um, to retake for microphones. Um, has, what do we say to the, to the business model of landlordism? Um, what's the role of government? And uh, what about infrastructure and SIL? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start on, um, on landlords. I don't think we disagree as, as much as, uh, as, as, as maybe uh, uh, your question in, implies. Um, I think the business model from a landlord perspective has changed, um, and uh, particularly with um, the elements you identify, but also uh, change in taxation policy and also change in um, uh, interest rates and, 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 and that sort of thing, which means uh, the sort of buy to let model um, has, uh, has, been, has been eroded. Um, I, I also agree with your point around um, it's not just building homes, um, it might be taking existing properties and refurbishing them or cutting them in different uh, ways. Um, so I think those are all, all valid observations. Um, I guess my point is the reason why I emphasize build and supply so much is all other things being equal. Um, so I, I can't, I, I, I can't uh, necessarily fix the tax policies or the, uh, and interest rates are determined by many other, other things, particularly um, inflation. Um, but um, all other things being equal, take a given set of policy that we have and a given interest rate and given taxation that we have, if we increase the supply of uh, properties, uh, the price will, will come down over time. Um, and from our analysis, uh, beyond cost of rent day, um, the rate at which the UK has been building new properties has been fairly slow. And whereas population growth for a mixture of births and immigration has significantly outstripped that. Um, and so we're in a situation where demand is increasing, but supply is flat or fairly stagnant. Um, now, one way you can fix that as, an, as a landlord is to take a townhouse and convert it into four flats. And now four people can, can live in, in the space that uh, one did before. Um, that might get you some of the way to solving the problem. But I think fundamentally, all things being equal, we need more space allocated to housing in some form or another. Um, and the way you chop and change it uh, is, is less fundamental. Um, and I think that is the only way to really fix it. I think that's the, the root problem at the, uh, at, at the core of, of why there's a housing crisis in, in the UK. Um, on your question around uh, what's the role of government, um, it's, uh, it's a debate for another time. It's, uh, a, uh, it's a long one to answer. Um, I would say in general, government doesn't have a very good record of uh, governments, not this government, but just government as a general term in the UK and abroad doesn't have a very good record in nationalized industries um, and doesn't have a very good record of building things on time to budget at a good price and good quality. Um, and so um, the idea that um, the solution is for government to build a lot of homes, um, I don't think is, is the right solution. Um, now, if it's a choice between not building the home at all and a government-built home, um, despite my wider market principle, I would, I would rather have the government-built home <laughs> versus no home. Um, but I think the key point is that if you've liberalized the planning around a particular site, um, I think the private market is able to construct uh, a home in the same form as what would have been built and do so um, more, more effectively, more 
uh, at a better price and, be and a, better, a better quality uh, than, than the government would do. Um, and I think you, you can look at the contrast of the two models that these exist. Um, go to Berlin and look at West Berlin and East Berlin and compare and contrast. Or more extreme, go to uh, a country in Western Europe and uh, a, a country that suffered uh, under the Soviet Union. And I would rather have the types of properties that we were building over the period 1945 to 1990 than uh, the uh, sort of Stalinist tower blocks, uh, the, the model that they went for um, off, off the two. An extreme example, but I think it's worth taking ideas to their logical ex ex extent because that's actually been applied. Um, and then lastly, uh, the trans transport question. Um, I think that's uh, a, a very valid point. Um, we haven't done a cost of transport day yet, and I don't know, or cost of infrastructure day. Uh, I'll have a ponder on what that would look like. Uh, but obviously, infrastructure is really, really important as well uh, because it makes uh, properties that were perhaps less attractive more attractive. If um, you take a leafy suburb near to London uh, that is not connected to London, it takes an hour and a half to get in to London, and are able to connect it in some way that that journey time is cut from an hour and a half to 30 minutes, uh, it now becomes a more viable place for somebody to live uh, and to commute into their job in, 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 a, in, a, in, 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 in central London. Um, and so it extends the net of what are uh, exciting and interesting rental properties for uh, young people in, in, in particular. So uh, yes uh, to more transport, yes to more infrastructure around uh, that, tr that transport. Um, and there's a whole lot more that one could discuss on that, but I think best discussed downstairs over yes. a drink. Um, time to drink us dry. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, obviously, the chairman will be here to answer more questions downstairs over a glass of wine. But can we all give a uh, healthy round of applause for James Lawson, chairman of the Amsterdam Institute? <laughs>